From New York Times Opinion, this is The Ezra Klein Show. I hate to do this because I know the cliche when the host says, my guest today needs no introduction. But what, I'm really going to sit here and introduce who Tom Hanks is to you. It's a, a waste of your time and mine. But he does have a new book out, The Making of Another Major Motion Picture Masterpiece, which follows up his short story collection, Uncommon Type, both of which are a real delight. And there's a reason I wanted to have this conversation, and I'm going to try to let it unfold, but I've always been interested in Hanks as a kind of interpreter of America. And also somebody who gets something that has often fallen out of fashion, both politically and culturally, even as it maintains a huge amount of strength and appeal, which is the power of sincerity in American culture and the way in which there's this constant push and pull between elite intellectual culture, which is more cynical, which is more ironic, and mass culture, which is more sincere many ways patriotic, at least wants to believe that we all can agree on things, even if the people in it don't all agree on things. And Hanks is somebody who's navigated the currents of this for a very long time now, very adroitly. I don't think you can have played the role as the movie star everybody can agree on, right? The nice guy of American movies for this long, in this many changing versions of America, without understanding something pretty deep about the American psyche. So that was a conversation I wanted to have with him here, and it was a lot of fun. As always, my email, EzraKleinShow at NYTimes.com. Tom Hanks, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ezra Klein. So I wanted to start in your earlier book of short stories, Uncommon Type. And in that book, you have a typewriter appearing in every single story. You've talked a lot in different interviews about your love of typewriters. And I'm going to admit to being a cynic here. I thought this was maybe a cute affectation. So you had a, a hobby for the public. But then one of our producers, Kristen Lynn, wandered into Gramercy Typewriter Company in New York. <laughs> and the owner told her that you text him photos of typewriters you see in your travels with questions about them. So this is clearly real. What attracts you to typewriters? The permanence of a typewriter. When I was a kid, my dad who, on the GI Bill, went to uh, USC. He got out of the Navy, he was in the Pacific, and he bought a second-hand Remington typewriter. He uh, ended up uh, being a professor. He taught restaurant and hotel food preparation at Laney College in Oakland, California, and he would type his tests and his syllabus on this ancient typewriter. He had such a vicious, pounding nature (laughs) <laughs> when it came to physical work, that the letters on the most used keys, the S and the E, were literally worn away to different shapes than the rest of the keys. And I would hunt and peck on that as a little kid, but it was this formidable ancient piece of gimcrackery that had survived my dad's youth. And I looked upon it as it might have been the only thing my dad had that was pre my existence. And so my handwriting is atrocious. And there is a story in the collection called These Are the Meditations of My Heart. And though it is a female protagonist, it is the story of how I got my first quality typewriter, a machine designed and engineered for the recording permanent recording of your thoughts and wishes and love letters and memos and shopping lists. And when I walked home from a uh, Cleveland, West Side Cleveland business office machines with a Hermes 2000 typewriter, I knew I had then with me the vehicle for a type of permanence that I, I, I did not have uh, in other parts of my life. I, I, I must say, I will confess, That machine is long gone, lost to a lot of moves and my kids pounding the living daylights out of it until it became in disrepair. But I have since replaced it, and I do get other typewriters, and I always travel with one. And here's the thing, though, Ezra. It's one thing to own typewriters. It's something else completely to use them. And I type every single day. My main personal correspondence is in typewriters. I 
send letters all the time. And uh, sometimes uh, I, I have any number of people that I keep a regular correspondence with because a typewritten letter is never thrown away. That's one thing. And two, if you take care of it, it will last as long as the carvings on the stone wall of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. You are not just applying words onto paper. You are stamping them into the fibers with permanent ink. And there's something about that that I find very, very romantic. And I will also say permanent. And that is why I have way too many typewriters. And Ezra Klein, if you were to say to me right now, well, I'd like a typewriter, one would be on your desk in about two and a half weeks mm. from my collection, under the promise, however, that you use it every single day. That's a lot of power to, to hold. Can I admit something to you and to our vast audience? I think that's the purpose of any podcast, Ezra. I've never learned to type. I am, even today, a hunt and peck typer. I can do 85 words a minute, hunt and peck, but, but I guess like your father, who had, I think you described it as a thunderous typing. One of my good friends used to call me the Black Sabbath of typing because it's so <laughs> loud. I've been in press conferences with Nancy Pelosi and, and others, and I've had staffers come to shush my typing because it was distracting the principal from... On a laptop? On a laptop? On a laptop. That is the force with which I hunt and peck. <laughs> well, how many of those have you used up in your career? My God, if you're, if you're actually applying physical pressure onto a laptop, they got to take a beat. It's tough karma to be my laptop keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, But wait, wait. You never learned essentially touch typing. Never. QWERTY, AAA uh -uh. space, FFF space. Really? Yeah, it keeps being on my list. I, I took a summer class in it for a minute. This is definitely what people came to this podcast to hear me telling you about my typing. But I took a summer class in it for a minute, but I had a lot of trouble paying attention in those days and just dropped out or didn't complete it or didn't learn it or whatever. And then I just was, I don't know, good enough hunt and pecker. But I've been meaning to go back to this. So it is one of my my goals for the next couple of years to actually learn By how to way, type. By the way, 85 words per minute, this is nothing. The, the speed of which one types has nothing to do with it. It's the thoroughness with which one types. When you start typing and you, and you do not stop typing until you get to the end of the idea, that's the only thing that matters. That, that is fair. I think I probably type 30 words a minute because I keep going back and forth and trying to figure out what I really want to say. Well, let's get to that question of what you want to say because what, what I always like about thinking about the way people write is that different mediums and technologies you do think differently in them. I would write a different piece on a typewriter from writing it in the iPhone Notes app, from mm -hmm. writing it on my laptop, from writing it by hand, where I have terrible, I guess, like you, handwriting. So how do you think differently on the typewriter? What is different about the words that come out than if you're doing them on a computer or in a notebook? A pondering is the way I would say it. Knowing that it's going down and it is going to be permanent. Look, I'm not against going back and just Xing out everything on the line and then starting all over again or just stopping a paragraph and then beginning again fresh at the top. But there is sort of like a curly cued thought process that goes where I do write slower than I think, but the paradox is I end up typing almost as fast as the final version of what I want to say does come out because it is going to be down there forever and there's no such thing as a delete key and uh, I don't even pull the paper out and rip it up and throw it away unless there's so many typos in it that none, none of it makes sense but it's going to last a very long time if you end up saying this is it this is what is complete so I do go a little bit slower but I also want it to read as though it's more like a Kurosawa screenplay than <laughs> <laughs> that it is one of my own, you know. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to have some jazz to it somehow, and sometimes that can be an overuse of ellipses, and sometimes it can be starting a sentence with the same word over and over again. And this is the stuff that you end up putting into everything, from a letter to somebody that you don't know very well to uh, something that I'm just leaving for my wife in the morning because I'm out of the house at six thirty, and I know she's not going to uh, see me until later on in the in the evening, but. I guess not, to have the same sort of sense of gravitas that whatever I typed on a piece of paper was thought about was not just thrown off the cuff like you would a text or an email or something in your notes. I have a, I, this is, this is how insane I am. I have one rig at home. I built a desk myself while well, I designed it. And a friend of mine who was good with uh, wood helped me, uh, helped me build it. And what it is, is it's, a, it's the right height for a typing table. And I took a Hermes Media Professional Quality Typewriter and I bolted it to a flip-up surface. So I 
can type anything I want to and then pull the paper out, flip up the typewriter so it's up and out of the way, and then on the surface below it, address it, make any changes or whatever, and sign it, and off it goes. So that, that's one aspect that's insane about it. But the other aspect is I went out and bought a huge box of old-school dot matrix printer paper, the type that is perforated and has the... Uh, what do you call them? It has the things on the side. The sides with like the little holes that you tear off? With little holes, sprockets. It has sprockets I was, on I it. did not know that word. Okay, let's call it sprockets on a dot matrix printer. And essentially, I have one piece of paper that is can be like three and a half miles long. And um, I roll that in and I can go for anywhere from three to seven pages without having to stop. That's how it gets you, Ezra. That's That's how it gets you. So was a new book written on a typewriter? A lot of it was, but nothing, anything that counted. I mean, I, I do all sorts of paragraphs and notes and uh, ideas and outlines on a, on, and I oftentimes don't use any of it at all. But what, what, the, and there, so why in the world would you do that, Hanks? And the reason is, is because the percussiveness of it, the sound, the rhythm, it ends up being like a bit of a snare drum that I can feel in my bones as I go around. And I, when I can really get going on it, the sound and the rhythm of the chuck, 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 is the sound of, it almost like is a Charlie Chaplin uh, score for modern times or something like that. It's a dun 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 and feel all at the same time. I think uh, I compare the sound of that as uh, like a ball-peen hammer on an anvil as you're pounding out a horseshoe, as opposed to typing on a laptop, which is like just a little clicking of knitting needles. Sometimes I just need the bigger volume. I need the heavier sound. So the new book is called The Making of Another Major Motion Picture Masterpiece, and it is about a movie called the, the masterpiece in question, Nightshade, The Lath of Firefall, and that movie is built on a comic. So tell me about the comic you've invented in the, in the book. Tell me about the source material at the center of this little universe. Source material for motion pictures oftentimes go back to the thought that was in somebody's head when they were six years old. I've talked to any number of the directors who remember seeing something, not necessarily from a movie, but witnessing something in their lives that has always hung with them. And in this case, uh, one of the characters saw a comic book when he was only five, and it was right after World War II, and there were an awful lot of stories out of the war. And uh, in the coin of the realm of uh, this day and age, it ends up being incorporated into a long-standing series of superheroes. And there's a superhero by the name of Eve Knight who becomes Nightshade. And she has incredible powers that she's trying to flee from and she can never sleep. And she envisions being haunted by this flamethrower who ends up entering into her life in order to... Uh, come for her grandfather, who himself was a, uh, a veteran of uh, World War II. And so the vernacular here is one of a superhero battle of powers and wits and sensuality that has kind of been the coin of the realm now for quite some time. And so in order to write a book about the making of a movie, the special effects-laden superhero movie, seem to be recognizable enough without having to get into too many of the specifics. I wanted to spend a moment in the comic, because I'm a comics nerd, and you stretched across something that I think is interesting there, which is the original inspiring comic. There's a, a lot of scenes in the book of 1950s, 1960s Americana, and the comic that inspires all this with uh, the Marines and the flamethrowers is from this early era where comics represent this kind of Americana. Very famously, the first Captain America comic, it has him punching out Hitler on the cover of it. Then later, comics become much likelier to critique that kind of Americana, which seems to me to happen with this character as time goes on. And that feels true for movies, too, to me, that we've moved in general from culture that aims at a kind of consensus, the sort of what everybody can agree on, to culture that aims at a kind of critique. Does that feel true to you? 
Yes, it does. And it comes hand in hand with the advancement of essentially computer graphics. I mean, you don't have to go back very far to remember they couldn't make comic book movies until CGI and computers made it possible. I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, you don't have to go back very far. I mean, George Reeves is Superman of the 1950s. It was incredibly fake. Maybe, you know, Michael Keaton's Batman and Christopher Reeves' Superman, even those were made with wires and uh, stuntmen and special effects that were still firmly rooted in the, in the physical world. Um, CGI comes along and you can literally do anything that you can possibly imagine. So don't you wonder sometimes, Ezra, as, as, uh, how many Spider-Mans there can be? that seem to all exist in the same timeline or now different timelines or how often Batman surprises somebody in a club in Gotham City. Someone always seems to say, who are you? And it's like, I'm saying, have you seen all these other Batman movies for crying out loud? It's the, they keep uh, coming back around and around and around. But the glory, I think, that comic books that had for me was they existed pretty much in one universe. They Each one had a very specific beginning, middle of an end uh, and an end. And there was a big difference, I think, between DC Comics and Marvel Comics, mostly in because of the storylines and the maturity of the Jack Kirby and the Stan Lee Marvel. That has, I think, brought it through to the course of uh, today. There seems to be a never-ending appetite for more looks into but it's, I guess, the psychological drama that goes into these people that have incredible superpowers and what did they do with them and how did they use them? And along with the physical aspects of making a movie where absolutely anything can happen, it also seems to be the case with the storylines, too. They go into places that I can never, ever predict. And I guess that's part of the attraction. I want to hold for a second on why there's such an appetite for it, because I think there's something interesting there, too. But, but I want to go back to something here on this question of consensus versus critique, because it feels to me like it recurs in the book in a few different ways. So you have these old comics, and the book spends a bunch of time in, in sort of 50s and 60s America that are a little bit more about representing America as a kind of holistic, united front, and then modern comics. And I think a lot of modern movies are much more about critiquing that, right? The movie that kicks the renaissance of comic movies off, Iron Man with Robert Downey Jr., that's very much a critique of the military-industrial state and one yep. man's complicity in it. And the beginning of the book, not the part about comics, but the part that sets up the plot almost entirely, includes a, a pretty stirring attack on haters of movies. But it read to me as a little bit more mm. than that, on a culture of being more interested in why we don't like things than, than why we do like them. And it, it felt to me that you're playing quite a bit here with this question of why we've moved from things that were meant to be in this consensus zone to things that were meant to critique the idea that this consensus was a good zone ever in the first place. I think it's because we have entered into a realm of cynicism seems to be much more of a default position for an awful lot of the uh, cultural exchange. Who's behind this? What does it really mean? What's really being said? What's the PR version of what is being put forward to it? What, what's the real nefarious purpose that is behind this? Without a doubt, I think there is a sort of positivity that says, you know, as everybody gets together and does their best, we can actually get together and figure something out together. And yet you take that concept and put it into a cynical position, which I do think is sort of like the, the first stop that an awful lot of cultural exchange goes through, is, number one, well, why? Will it really make a difference? Who gains and who doesn't gain? And what does this really mean? And I think that in a type of superhero movie, the common battle, I think, or the most approachable aspect of the battle, is not good versus evil. It ends up being some other combination of, well, I'm not really well-versed in all the movies, but when you have an, somebody evil coming from some other dimension in order to conquer the planet Earth, without a doubt, well, you know, that's evil and the good has to get together and, and do it. But even in, even in the alliance of those against it, it ends up being all sorts of conflicting emotions and conflicting motivations. Look, there's two types of cynicism. One is you know, righteous cynicism, you know, like follow the money, you know, that's a pretty good brand of cynicism. But there is the other type, which is just natural knee-jerk kind of, oh, come on, this really, who do you think you are? What, what are you even trying to do this for? What are you trying to prove? 
And I think uh, that that represents in a lot of ways what people, the most fun thing in order to search out oftentimes is, well, what's the conspiracy behind all of this? The, the nature of uh, what's going on in the, in the smoke-filled rooms and the cabal of people trying to sway their influence. And I think that's represented in, in these huge, huge, huge movies in which we have conflicted superheroes that uh, seem to still be somehow those plucky misfits who still are able in order to uh, learn their lesson and come together. I'm going to admit that this was never really a question about superheroes, but a question thinly guised uh, about you. I can handle that. <laughs> Which is that one of the things I see when I look at your work in the books and the movies is there is much more sentimentality. And I mean that really, truly as a compliment in an age of a lot of irony. And that's also sort of true in the image it is either built around you or that you have built around yourself. There is a, a sense of, yeah, maybe it's sincerity, positivity. I'm not sure exactly what to call, but it does feel a little counter-programmed today. It feels like it harkens back, and a lot of the source material harkens back to an idea of a kind of America that was there once and probably still is, but has become a little out of intellectual fashion. So first I should just ask, does that resonate for you as an interpretation? Yes, I think it does. Look, I'm 66. Uh, I was born in 1956, and I did not have a standard type of youth or home. I was wandering around on my own, pretty unsupervised from a very early age. I was an eight-year-old kid that was riding the bus for hours on my own in uh, through Oakland, California. And looking back on it now, I can remember there were some malevolent characters out there that I figured out pretty quickly were malevolent. But I will tell you this, I came across many, many, many more people who seemed to be fair and kind and honest. Sometimes it was, you know, the old guys who ran the candy store that was down on the corner who seemed to delight in having a bunch of kids around. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't some sleazy guys who were uh, outside the candy store saying, hey, would you? I'll buy you some candy. Would you like some candy? I was aware from a very young age that there were folks out there to be avoided. But I also was able to enjoy over and over again, I guess sort of like the faith and hope of people that didn't have to have any sort of faith or hope. They didn't have to cotton to me. We moved around a lot. My dad and my mom got divorced very young and we were, my dad was in the restaurant business and there were three of us. Uh, and I had a younger brother that didn't live with me and we were always on our own. We were, seemed to be all, we were latchkey kids before in the, we, I didn't even know what a latch was. But we made our own way, and we made our own way, and we seemed to be laughing more often than we were terrified, even though we lived in some places that were naturally quite lawless. But uh, I had a teacher for two and a half years, Mrs. Castle, who just told me I was smart, and she told me I was curious, and she told me that I was good-natured. And I didn't know I was any of those things, but I ended up understanding. So I think I have always carried, I guess, some degree of those qualities to me because I, I don't think I ever lived specifically in fear, despite the fact that I lived in an awful lot of confusion all the time. But I, again, I was lucky because there was always some combination of friends I made whose parents were really cool, who were, you know, the semi-adoptive presence in my life for a number of years. And along with the backdrop, too, that was going on, you know, one of the themes that keeps coming back in an awful lot of my work, uh, I will I will admit, is uh, the war, specifically World War II, because every adult that I knew spoke of the war in capital letters. Well, that was during the war. That was before the war. That was right after the war, and they wore those years in their shoulders, in their body language. They talked about it as it was the shared common Rubicon that they all crossed. And there was part of me that just thought, I wish I had something like that in my life. And I didn't have anything like that until you know, John F. Kennedy was assassinated when I was in, uh, what, second grade. Then also at two, because I was in school and it was part of uh, the daily news and also the daily science class was the space program was going on and it was Mercury and it was Gemini and it was Apollo and 
they landed on the moon. Uh, and talk about a Rubicon for all humanity. I mean, uh, July 20th, 1969 was everybody knew what they were doing. They were, all, they were all at home watching the moon landings all around the world. And so I had these two superstructure themes that every adult was participating in. And one is the war, which we won. The other one was going to the moon, which was an evolutionary step in the history of all of humankind that turned out to be possible. But but also the winning of a kind of war with the Soviet Union. Well, and that was, yes, and that was always ongoing. And, you know, I, rem- I also d- very much remember thinking at the time, it can't be that simple. What was going on in the Soviet Union was almost comical in its in- ineptness at the same time that it was lethal in its contrariness to the human condition. I remember thinking, human beings don't live like that in the, you know, the grand scheme of what all the stuff that was communist. I mean, of course, after 69, we were very much involved in Vietnam that I knew this was not World War II. I, n- I never went along goody two-shoes with, you know, the concept of that was a just war and it was the same thing and all the lessons that we learned in the past we can apply to the future. Even I knew, hey, that was then, this is now, and shouldn't we all know better? I was aware at a pretty early age that, oh, I think we're being lied to here, guys. I think they are lying to us. And then on the top of that, I graduated from high school in 1974. So we had the Watergate hearings and everything that was going on along with that. So um, I was very much aware that uh, America was in a brand of tumult right there. But what I did not give into was an ongoing type of cynicism that said it's all corrupt that it is all worthless. Because even then, I was coming across people that were honest and forgiving and willing to uh, sit down and discuss the differences. But I didn't, I never, I always was saying, well, where's the fractions in this? What are the divisions in this? Where is it going to be evident that um, there are folks who are out there constantly thinking of what is the right thing to do here? And also, dare I say it, What is the correct American thing to do here? Because I was aware that just from basic educational aspects of it, that uh, here's what I knew is that in the United States of America, your parents could come into your room and say, we're, we're moving. You would load up everything into car and you would move as many as 300 miles away, start all over again. And guess what? There was a school that you would go to that wasn't all that difference in quality from the school you had been going to. And it was free and it was in walking distance. And you were going to have some brand of a teacher that was going to evaluate you on their own individual perspective of who you are. And that to me, that's what America was at its most basic. So I want to pick up on on America there because I I've taken America as your great subject, which isn't true for everybody in your line of work. I don't think America is the subject of Tom Cruise or Will Smith or or a bunch of other great actors. And in particular, the stories America tells about itself. You you mentioned that a lot of your work has revolved around World War II. You've also done amazing movies about Vietnam. And I think World War II is sort of where America's idea of itself, or in some ways, one of its modern ideas of itself, cohered. And Vietnam is where it also began to fall apart, like this huge counter-narrative emerges in a very central way. It has always, of course, been there in other ways. And that's true in your book, too. I mean, it, it spans these wars. The heroes come out of these wars in different ways. The, the people in them are affected by the wars in different ways. So how do you see the way that the stories America tells about itself And the stories America now responds to changed in the tension between these two. Uh, It's because we've forgotten our history. We no longer study it, Ezra. Now, that's what I would say. And I'm only a layman historian. I read history for pleasure. But again and again, I think there is a through line to our history of the United States of America that is both checkered and promising, without a doubt. There's that line from uh, Days to Confused, you know, they're letting out for the summer. And just remember, the 4th of July is celebrating a bunch of rich, white slave owners who didn't want to pay their taxes. You know, there is there is a great truth that, that those were the guys who signed the Declaration of Independence. World War II, of course, we were still a segregated nation. If you were black and American, you, unless you were part of the Tuskegee Airmen and perhaps in some parts of the Navy, uh, you did not fight. You served food or you packed bags. So we can't pretend that a perfect America went into all of these things in the past. But 
and improving America did. I go back again and again to the preamble of the Constitution of the United States that says in order to form a more perfect union. And I, when I come across examples of that, I find it nearly heartbreaking that it's not taught or it's not spoken of in a way <laughs> that is interesting. When history is not taught, we do not have an appreciation for how far we have come as the originators of an incredibly imperfect form of government, but just about the best that has ever existed despite all of its imperfections because it is governed from this concept that we are, po we are always trying to create a more perfect union. I read John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. Oh, I love that um, book. It's a great book. And there's a, there's a scene that I remember in reading that. I, I, I'm going to say I read it in uh, late junior high school. I read it when I was 13 or 14 or 15 years old. And he's driving along in his pickup truck with his, uh, with his camper on the back and Charlie, his dog. And he sees an old black man walking along a hot road. And he stops, John Steinbeck says, and said, sir, would, would you like a ride? And the fellow gets in his cab and they drive along. And Steinbeck speaks about trying to reach out and connect with this fellow, trying to communicate somehow that, you know, he understands the plight in the South. And this, you know, this was the early, what, late, late 1950s, early 1960s when he made this. So civil rights and the divisions between black and white America are at the forefront of uh, uh, the Daily News. And he fails. John Steinbeck fails. What he's trying to do, he's trying to reach out to another American, probably maybe his same age, but of a completely different race. And he cannot make a connection. Why? Because the divide is too wide. It's too huge. It's written in capital letters, capital W for white and capital B for black. And I remember reading that and being a little bit chilled because it was an example of how big the divide was. And it remind, <laughs> reminded me right there that we still have a long way to go if we are going to create a more perfect union. Vietnam, <laughs> Vietnam was not a great war for the United States. And you can go back to any number of areas and say, here's all the reasons that we should never have asked a bunch of young boys to go off and fight for our country as they were asked to and, and as they did. That doesn't subtract for a moment everything that they went through and everything that they experienced. And it certainly doesn't remove any of the baggage and tragedy that they carried with them for the rest of their lives after that for a whole generation of people. Vietnam is the Rubicon that was crossed, and I wouldn't. And I think perhaps it could be that one of the degrees of cynicism that has existed ever since is that just as when I was five, ten, eleven years old, and every adult that I knew was talking about the war, as in what they did from 1941 through 1945, nine, ten, eleven-year-old kids are they're hearing about the war, but it's the one in Vietnam, and the lessons that come from that is a very different sort of uh, burden. You're probably used to this being the, the case in this conversation by now, but this, what's going to come here is not going to be crisp. But I want to pull out something I, I think is interesting here. My topic is American politics much more than it is American culture. And, and what I take to be a very live question is this tension between appealing to the story of the improving America, the good America, the better angels of America— and living in the story of America's fractures, of its shortcomings, of its shortfalls. And both the left and the right, I think, have their versions of this right now. If you think about the way the rhetoric of a George W. Bush differed from the rhetoric of a Donald Trump, if you think of the way the rhetoric of Joe Biden differs from the rhetoric of many on the left, that there is always this tension. And I think it's often an elite and mass tension. The intellectual culture tends to be much more focused on critique, on what is wrong, 
And mass culture tends to be very interested in sincerity on, politically speaking here, patriotism. Uh, this gets called corny. You have unbelievable amounts of love for the, sh the play Hamilton. Then there's kind of an elite backlash to it. And this just comes on again and again. And one reason I'm having this conversation with you is that I actually see you as somebody who has for a long time been exploring the boundaries of that kind of mass interest in the sincere, in, you know, you were Mr. Rogers a few years ago, you were Captain mm -hmm. Sully. You, you've often gravitated around these places where even now America's figures it can agree on, even now America's figures whom a lot of people find beautiful or inspiring because they seem to somehow not be inside the the divisions. And, and Rogers is maybe a, a good example of this and a, a particular example of this. He's become almost canonized in the past couple of years. And when I watched that movie, it had much more dark elements than I was expecting in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about this attraction for you. I mean, is this a conscious thing for you that, that you are looking for what people can actually agree on at a time when the the culture seems to have turned towards emphasizing what we cannot? I don't take any of these gigs unless there's something about it that absolutely fascinates me. And I said, well, that hasn't been explored. There's something that, that, that is deeply rooted that are going to show something else. And I have played a number of people who I had to talk to before I made the movie about them. Jim Lovell on Apollo 13, Charlie Wilson, Charlie Wilson's War, Richard Phillips uh, on Captain Phillips. Chesley Sullenberger, Sullen. and I'm, I met all sorts of people who uh, knew Fred Rogers extraordinarily well. And out of there comes the chance to get down to a sort of root philosophy about them. Or, well, let me put it this way. I think the best versions of making what I call nonfiction entertainment is behavior and the procedure that illuminates the grand motivations of who they are. And I'll just give you this about Fred Rogers. Is, I don't know if you know this, but Fred Rogers was an ordained minister. He was the reverend of Fred Rogers. And he went to his church and said, I do not want to have a church. I want my church to be children's television. And television was so new, they kind of said, huh? What? How do you do that? No, that's not how this works. And he ended up explaining what he could do with his theological background that then became the Mr. Rogers neighborhood that we're familiar with. And he, Mr. Rogers never used the word God in any of his broadcasts. He never taught about heaven or hell. He never talked about the Ten Commandments or the apostles. He never brought up the Bible. What he did was he tended to the fears and the understandings of his congregation, and his congregation was made up of three- and four-year-old kids who were afraid of being sucked down the toilet if they fell into it while it was being flushed. Well, you start with that, and then you just get to this kind of place where after that, I mean, even uh, Fred's uh, wife would just say, well, hey, you know, well, Tom, you know, uh, Fred was a complicated guy, and life is just one damn thing after another, isn't it? And you take that into account, and then you realize, well, that's the case with all of these guys that I've played, Charlie Wilson and certainly Richard Phillips and, and certainly uh, Sully, who, on one hand, did something magnificent in saving the lives of every single person that was on that plane. He knew that if anybody had drowned, that he would be blamed. What I see, I guess, in all of these guys is some form of will-breaking pressure that they do not show. And in some cases, the movie is not interested in showing. But as the actor playing all those guys, I have written about that back-breaking pressure, that that will-defeating uh, uh, demo possible demoralization. Uh, did they do the right thing? Are they doing their job right? Are they endangering anybody? And that's what I bring to the process well before we end up shooting. And because it's nonfiction, because it is based on real people in real circumstances, even though as I said to all these guys, I'm going to say things you never said, be places you never were, and do things you never did. Inside that still has to be sort of the molecular DNA of that all-encompassing truth of why they do what they do 
for a living and or in the subject of the movie, along with how they did it. And that ends up being behavior and procedure. And to me, as an actor and as a guy who reads history, and of course now it's trying to write something that actually reflects their, the world as, uh, as I know it, that's job number one, man. There's nothing more fascinating to me than that. The moment in that movie that sticks with me the most is when the journalist asks Mr. Rogers' wife about how Fred Rogers manages to be so damn nice all the time. And she says, he works at it all the time. It's a practice. I'm curious about this on two levels. One, what you learned from reading about studying that side of him, right? The swimming, the praying, the things that kept him grounded in himself. But but two... I have to imagine, and I feel like it was threaded through the answer you just gave me, that you've got a reputation for being a nice guy. You get called America's dad. I mean, there's a certain amount of backbreaking pressure, I'm sure, in feeling like there is this public Tom Hanks who cannot be betrayed. I'm curious what practices you took from Rogers or what practices you have yourself to maintain groundedness in that. Well, it does require a certain degree of work, but there also has to be with it, I think, a a sense of the value to it. I mean, it's valuable, I think, to the self. What do we all want to be, Ezra? I think we all want to be compassionate, right? I think we all want to uh, be both enlightening and enlightened by all that we go through and uh, all that we discover and all that we witness. And I think also, I think we want to both experience joy. And if there's a way in order to create it, I think we all want to be able to create joy because I've sort of woken up every morning uh, from being a socially conscious human being of some degree of seeking joy. But that doesn't mean the world is always wonderful because enlightenment comes from bitter compromise. Enlightenment comes from tragedy. Enlightenment comes by way of conquering something that, uh, if left service, is going to somehow destroy destroy you. Compassion, likewise. We want to both be able to feel the compassion of others. But what good is that if we don't have compassion for other people, including those that we don't know? I mean, the story told about John Steinbeck picking up that old the black man in the South. He had compassion for him. But what enlightenment did he get from that exchange? He got from that the divide is so great that uh, it can't be penetrated in the length of a 20-minute uh, lift into town. I do understand the purchase and sort of like contract I have with with the last three generations of moviegoers because my career happened to coincide with the invention of the VHS uh, tape cassette. So I have babysat an awful lot of kids who were left at home in order to watch any number of movies while mom and dad went out. And now, of course, we live in a circumstance where you can see anything you want to anytime you want to. And so I know that, you know, I've been in an awful lot of people's uh, living rooms and even the stuff that uh, is probably more obtuse and uh, not exactly the type of everybody's uh, movie cues. I can't tell you how often somebody comes up to me and says, I was in a hotel room and I was in, you know, uh, Dalhart, Texas, and uh, I, I, I ended up watching that movie that you made in Saudi Arabia. What was that about? I said, and then we could talk about this this movie I made called Hologram for the King and everything that, that it stood for. So I know what that is, and I don't discount it for a minute. But at the same time, you have to walk this fine line, and I think perhaps Mr. Rogers did, and I'm going to think that also Sully did, and also... Richard Phillips is, you can't let anybody take advantage of that good nature. And there are people out there that are hell-bent on doing that very thing, to take advantage of that good nature or to assume that somehow you're a pushover or somehow assume that it's not real, that it doesn't really count, that it's not really who you are that you're putting on some sort of performance. And I'm not going to, look, without a doubt, the vast majority of press junk that anybody does in order to promote movies, that's as much a, a, a performance as uh, as the one you give in the movie. You, you, know, you have to go off and you do that kind of stuff. But that, that's part of the, everybody, I think, understands it's a p- part of the exchange as well. But then what's the, what's the value of going to be, look, I try to go to bed at night with as little self-loathing as possible. <laughs> and what I've learned over the course since, since I was born and not 1956, Ezra, what I've learned is that that requires an awful lot of work at being authentic with people to the degree that you owe them your authenticity. And an awful lot of people out there that I've come across are worthy of 
sort of like 100% of uh, how I understand my job and how I understand the what I've contributed to something. Because I have those same people that have contributed to me, you know, somewhere between James Brown and Chrissy Hind and, and uh, Paul McCartney, I have people that I wouldn't know what to say to them if I met them, because I would just be foaming all over, all over them saying, yeah, I can't, I, what you meant to me when I was growing up, I'd be the same exact way. And to get from them, which I have on occasion, a kind of a nod and an understanding and an appreciation for what that is. They put on clinics on how to be authentic as well and understand that it's a shared moment as opposed to a performed one. And what have you learned from that? When when somebody comes up to you and you mean something to them and you've never met them, how do you help them have the moment they want from you that they don't know how to get? I have a friend that went off. Actually, I think he wrote about it in his book, Matthew McConaughey. He told a story about being at this juncture in his life, and I hope it's in the book. Otherwise, I'm dropping too big of a name, in which case, Matthew, I I apologize. But he ended up seeking out a monk, (laughs) right, in a monastery somewhere that he heard was this great spiritual guide. And I've since talked to other guys who have, you know, talked to Buddhist monks and what have you. And what he did was uh, he poured out his life and all of his struggles to this guy for the better part of, you know, five hours. They just walked and talked and they just talked and talked and all, everything about Matthew's life came out, all of his struggles, all of his struggles, all of his difficulties, all of his, all of the tests that he felt as though he failed and whatnot and where he was now. And it was all over. The monk said this to him, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Which is, that's the thing to say. Because when someone is coming up to you, what they're saying is, yeah, I understand. Yeah, me too. Yeah. On one hand, you say, I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad it spoke to you. But what they're really weighing in with, what we're really uh, trusting you with, is the weight of what that did for them at that time. And we all have versions of that weight that was measured and lifted by some piece of art, some piece of, you get to know somebody on a plane and you have a conversation with them and then you land and you never see them again, but you never forget somehow that conversation you had with somebody on a plane because it is a shared board. And that's that, that old saying, you know, uh, uh, a problem shared is the problem halved. When someone comes up to me and they're not asking for a selfie, you know, they're not, they're not trying to have a, a, a moment of exchange, you know, like I was, I was once walking through the same door as Mickey Mantle was, I was not about to say anything to Mickey Mantle, you know, I just kind of like looked at him, you know, and uh, that was all that was required. But when someone invests a moment in time with me to say, um, hey, that really touched me, or that really helped me, or better, better yet, Hey, I've never forgot seeing that movie that you were in. I think what I what I try to say is, I know that feeling. I know what that means. And uh, ain't you cool? And then sometimes I say, slap me five, and then we get on with it. We we go our separate ways. You clearly have a, a hell of a work ethic. You've made more movies than I can count. You've done written the past couple of years two fiction books that are you put them together. They're almost a thousand pages of Tom Hanks writing. What role does rest, does pleasure, does play hold in your life or or in your work? Oh, I have vast amounts of time off where I don't do anything. I will say that I probably have attention deficit disorder based on knowing what time it was by what was on TV from a very early age. And uh, there was always, yeah, look, there's a commercial on about every 17 minutes. So I take a break every 17 minutes. But the concentrated work that I do uh, in my day job uh, as an actor is extremely focused. And let me also say finite. It goes on for a certain point and then is done. And when that is done, then I, I do nothing for weeks, months at a time. But I'm always clouded with ongoing ideas. So I think then that's a good place to end. Always our final question. What are three books you'd recommend to the audience? Three books would be Bear Town by Frederick Bachman. It's the first in a trilogy about a hockey, youth hockey club in a small town in Sweden. Uh, and I'm looking forward to reading the next two. Knowing a little bit about Sweden and uh, enough about hockey to be able to enjoy it. Uh, the Swerve by Stephen Greenblatt, How the Modern World Began. It's about uh, the discovery 
1417 of what had been a long lost Latin book or codex uh, of Lucretius that uh, in 1417 more or less gave way to modern thinking and uh, the advent of the of the Renaissance. And Trust by Hernan Diaz, which is a fabulous book, the structure of which is just gorgeous and tells an awful lot about what I'd like to think of as nonfiction entertainment by way of a novel, Gorgeous Books. Tom Hanks, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ezra Klein. I enjoyed talking to you. This episode of the Ezra Klein Show was produced by Annie Galvin, fact-checking by Michelle Harris with Mary March Locker. Our senior audio engineer is Jeff Gelb. Our senior editor is Roger Karma. The show's production team also includes Emma Falgau and Kristen Lin. Original music by Isaac Jones. Audience strategy by Christina Simaluski and Shannon Busta. The executive producer of New York Times Opinion Audio is Annie Rose Strasser. And special thanks to Pat McCusker. 